The formation of the Duke Forest is intimately connected to the transformation of Trinity College in the 1920s into Duke University. But by the 1930s, they recognized that they didn't need this essentially what was 5,000 extra acres at the time to build a campus that large. Dr. Clarence Korsgen was recruited here to take care of what was almost 5,000 acres of degraded agricultural landscape. And he would really shape the Duke Forest. When the Duke Forest was established in 1931, about 60% of it was either recently abandoned agriculture or agricultural areas that had been abandoned around the time of the Civil War. Large swaths were deforested. Not much was done to think about or care for the soil productivity. And so eventually when that land stopped producing, they would simply clear new land and start the process over again. But this left this easily erodible soil exposed and vulnerable to the elements. So Dr. Korshin came in to restore the productivity of the land, either planting loblolly pines where there had been agriculture or allowing natural regeneration to occur. With a soil scientist named Dr. Coyle, he established 87 permanent sample plots throughout the forest. And they did little experiments within each of those plots. What happens if we prune some of these trees? What happens if we fertilize some of the areas? and really initiated that research legacy of the forest. What's really special about Korshin and Coyle establishing those plots in the 30s is that they were rediscovered in the 70s and 80s by Dr. Norm Christensen, the founding dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment, and his colleague Bob Peet with UNC Chapel Hill. They rediscovered these plots and realized that they held the key to the forest past. So they augmented those 87 permanent sample plots with their own 230 additional plots and were able to really begin asking how has the forest changed over time? The trees themselves are living legacies that we can use to understand the past. We started with this core, with the land base, and over time we add rings of information and appreciation for what's happened before, what's led us to this point. And then we continue to take that and we grow and expand like the growth rings of a tree. The plots that were established by Korshin, picked up again by Bob Pete and Norm Christensen, have continued to be studied by students today. That fundamental data collection and how you get to know your woods, it's really the same. And what I think is different now is having that knowledge and information so that we can protect our forests in the future. Since 1931, the forest has been a destination for experimentation and understanding our natural world. That early research focus was really on how trees could provide restoration for the abandoned agricultural lands across the South at the time. Over the years, that's really expanded into forest biology, the ecology of forests, understanding how forests are changing over time in the last 30 years, that's really exploded into research across everything from the soil underneath our feet to climate mitigation strategies for the survival of species, to the electromagnetic activity in the outermost reaches of our atmosphere. We have a 90-year legacy on this land for teaching and research purposes, but the past human history and how it's shaped this forest is particularly important as well. 
One of the things that's so incredible about the forest is that you can still witness some of what life may have been like, and in particular for holding up those stories that have not been told before. When we think about actual archaeological evidence for indigenous peoples, throughout the Duke Forest we have been able to find some evidence of um, like arrowheads and axe heads, but indigenous culture has had such low impact on the land in this area that it can be really difficult to find remnants of their culture. And sometimes we're, we're just piecing together stories from very little evidence. Indigenous people are still, are still here and deeply involved with the community life in Orange and Durham counties. So we do know from oral histories um, some of the practices of indigenous people on or near Duke Forest land. The Duke Forest is actually really important in preserving human history. We have a number of different sites. Some of those sites were home to enslaved people. Some of these sites were home to indigenous people. And there aren't a lot of places in German Orange County where historic sites like these can still be seen or explored or understood. So this is the Robeson Mill site from records and from the history of other mill sites in this area, it's very likely that the mill was constructed by and run either entirely or partially by enslaved labor. So as we look at the detail of these rock walls and note the fact that they're still holding back earth, you know, 200 years later, imagining the work and effort that would have gone into this, kind of mind blowing to think about all the work that the enslaved labor force did. I think that these are likely to have been the grave sites of the enslaved family, Lynn, and another name, Squire. That there are no names or dates associated with them it is uh, very difficult to find enslaved burial sites in the South in general. Oftentimes we don't know for sure that that's what we found. And if this is in fact one of the enslaved burial sites, it's, it's very special, very um, important part of not only African American history, but of all human history in, in the Piedmont those physical, visual reminders of that human past on the land allows us to keep asking lots of questions and keep better understanding our human histories, our collective human histories, how they relate to today, how they inform us going forward. And I think that is something that's magical about the Duke Forest. That's the northern Perula calling. You can just hear all the warblers in the trees around us. There's a lot of ways for me to teach students about the natural environment by coming to sites like this. We can think about what happens during conditions with high human impact versus low human impact and how that affects the trees, their rate of growth, their species composition, but it also gives us a bit of time to correct what I call and what the literature calls shifting baseline syndrome which is often younger generations, you know, in, including me, we don't have a good sense of the biodiversity that was present in the past. People just don't, don't know. Like, we don't know. We just see a, a tiger swallowtail flying by and feel so um, happy, right, to see this beautiful butterfly. But maybe in natural conditions before human impact, there will have been thousands of butterflies. And then maybe again during this time period when this was a mill site, things would have been a lot more clear in this area. Maybe they hardly ever saw any 
butterflies. When you don't realize how much has been lost or how much has been changed, when you don't have a deep sense of history, the literature suggests that we have lost motivation to protect biodiversity when that's the case. So it's important that we recognize shifting baseline syndrome, that we teach about it so that we know what's already been lost and are more inclined to protect that which we still have. Portion specifically talked about that if we could connect people with their resources and give them a better understanding and appreciation of all that they provide for us, they will be empowered to be better stewards of our resources. And he already began to, to talk about what we now know as nature deficit disorder, or really this disconnection of people from their land base and the essential resources that sustain them. So this area had a lot of what we call Piedmont Prairie, which would have been these kind of open habitats on top of the hills and then forests in the floodplains along the rivers. And those prairies were maintained often by indigenous use of fire. The timber management program is a dynamic way that we keep the forest healthy, generate revenue to support the operation of the forest, and create a mosaic of habitat types. I think its most important value is the demonstration of our reliance on a resource that we have to extract but how to do it well and how to do it in a way that allows us to continue doing it over and over in the future and really sustaining our need for that particular resource. The Duke Forest is only becoming more important to the region, to the local communities, in that it is providing all of these fundamental services that we all need, clean air, uh, clean water, carbon sequestration, the opportunity to reconnect with nature. For this land base to continue providing those benefits to the region and the community going forward is incredibly important. I think more important than most appreciate because this land base has already existed for 90 years. This has been a roadway in some form for hundreds of years. It may not have been the same wooden bridge here, uh, when the Robeson's mill was operational, but something was here. And before a roadway was here, this was likely to have been an indigenous trail. And we know that so many roads in the Piedmont were historically Native American trails. And Native American trails are often derived from game trails. At some points in history, there are bison in this region, so they may have been bison or buffalo trail. It's just pretty incredible to think about the ecological links and the historical links through, through time, that this wooden bridge has been some sort of roadway, path, or ford, probably for millennia. I think it's incredible to think about this forest being available for my children to appreciate and learn about the environment in and for my children's children to be able to learn and appreciate the environment. And I honestly think it will be one of Duke's most enduring legacies that it has held on to this land for 90 years and that it holds on to this land in perpetuity and recognition of all the incredible tangible and intangible benefits that the forest provides.